Hello and welcome to another IES Operational Training. IES Operational Trainings illustrate the types of practices and habits that we believe provide the best possible outcomes for our company, and therefore should be followed unless otherwise guided by an authorized member of management. Thanks for watching. In Training Block 2.1, we will cover the basics of order management. Here, there are two major components to think about. First, we will cover the technical side of this area. Specifically, we will discuss how to build an order in TempWorks, what to include in that order, its detailed components, and more. However, along with that technical perspective, we will discuss the operational side of order creation, meaning how you interact with your client, what you ask when a client places an order, when it's appropriate to create or close an order, along with some other aspects of customer follow-up. Hello and welcome to TempWorks Training. In this section, we will introduce and discuss the basics of the order record in Enterprise Infinity. This training will cover all questions posed within the Order Part 1 section of your TempWorks workbook. Please feel free to follow along with the workbook during the training or you may answer the questions after. All right, let's begin. So in our last session, we wrapped up introducing the basics of the customer record as it related to recruiting. We did a lot of setup in that details area of the customer record. We talked about how all of those work sites are set up as physical locations and how all of the defaults that we set up on the customer record are going to flow into the orders that we create for that customer. Now, Let's say the moment comes, the company calls us and they are ready to place an order for three forklift operators. If that's the case, creating the order is as simple as hovering over the order bar and selecting the plus icon to create that new order. When I go to do that, it's opening up my new order window. And notice how intuitive and smart TempWorks is. It's pulling in the customer, the tile shop, because that's the record that I'm currently viewing. So it's trying to put two and two together. I'm viewing this customer and now I'm creating a new order. Am I doing this because I'm making a new order for the tile shop? So that's exactly what that's doing. Now, you don't have to be on a customer record to create a new order. You'll see if I even go back all the way to the home screen, I can still hover over that order bar and select the plus icon to create that new order. This time it doesn't have a customer to pull in, but that's okay. I can expand my list, scroll through and select the one I want, or we can begin typing in the company that we would like to create the new order for. So I'll grab the tile shop. In my order type dropdown, it's defaulting to temp for a temporary order. However, you'll see if I expand that dropdown, there's lots of different ways we can classify this order as a direct hire, is it a daily pay position, is it a payrolled order, is it an order that's scheduled to open, a temporary order, or a temp to full-time position. I'm going to leave it as temp and click to finish. This then jumps me to the details page of our order record. And let's just take a look at everything we see here on this details page. You're going to hopefully notice that a lot of it has filled in automatically from all of that information that we set up on our customer record. Beginning with this worker comp drop down here. Notice if I expand the worker comp drop down, instead of seeing a big huge list of lots and lots of worker comp codes, we see the four that we've been approved to staff with this company. All right, time for some honorable mention here. This workers' comp code area, although small on the screen, plays a big role in how IES conducts business with our customers. Workers' compensation class codes are codes that the insurance companies use to identify specific categories of work. For instance, you know a contractor supervisor by his title. However, an insurance company knows him as 5606. Insurance companies need to be able to categorize various types of work into class codes to be able to effectively estimate workers' compensation rates for the appropriate risk associated with the work being performed. For example, a 5606 contractor will have a more expensive work comp code rate than an 8810 clerical employee 
because more dangerous work is being performed. Further, if you find that there is no code to choose from at all, you must immediately contact either your recruiter, branch manager, or risk manager at the IES Support Center. You cannot place an employee on an order unless you have selected the appropriate worker's com code. Same thing on our work site. You may remember in our last training, we had set up a site titled Site 100. That's now listed in my drop down here. So when I select that, we see the directions and dress code information also automatically populate into my order. You'll notice with both of these drop downs, there's no ability for me to add in a new code. I couldn't attach a new code here and I couldn't attach a new work site here. What we're doing is selecting from a list of codes, from a list of sites, preset on the customer record. Now every new order that we create defaults to a required number of one. But if we need three people, I just change that required to three. You'll also notice that every new order defaults to a status of unfilled. When I successfully assign the number of people required on an order, in this case three, once I have three people assigned, TempWorks is automatically going to flip this order to a status of filled. Until that happens, our status is going to remain unfilled. You could always manually change it to best describe what is the current status. Did we lose the order to a competitor? Are we officially marking it as being partially filled and we're no longer working on it? Is the position on hold? For now, we'll leave it as unfilled. Moving on down the line in my job title here, this dropdown is gonna be very similar to a lot of the other dropdowns we've discussed in the system in that it is, you guessed it, 100% customizable by your team. All of that customization is going to happen from the administration module of TempWorks. I'm just going to go ahead and begin typing in forklift and that pulls up my forklift job title. All right, so I've got my job description added where we've got a basic description, the duties and responsibilities and requirements for the position. In our safety notes, we'll say first day includes a two hour safety training. Now, for my start date here, what I'm entering in as the start date is not necessarily me 100% committing to a date. You'll see that when we take an employee and attach them to an order, that will give us the assignment record. And on that employee's individual assignment record, I can always customize the start date. So what I like to put in here is, when does the client want these people to begin? So if they're calling me today on Wednesday and saying our goal is to have these three people start by Monday, I'm going to list that as my start date. In all reality, we might have one person that doesn't start until Tuesday or one that doesn't start until Wednesday. That's okay. On their individual assignment, we can clarify what their start date is. The duration falls into a similar category. I can enter a duration here and you'll see that it will automatically spit out an estimated end date. However, if May 8th comes and goes and people are happy as a clam working here, they're having a good time, there's plenty of work for them, that estimated end date passing is not going to end an assignment. It's not going to alert anyone of anything. The whole purpose that's here is just for your own individual tracking and reporting purposes so that you could potentially see here are all of our assignments that are scheduled to end this month. In my shift dropdown, we're now going to see all of those shifts that we had added onto that customer record. I'm going to go ahead and grab the AM shift. In the upper right hand corner of the financial details, we're going to see my multiplier code dropdown, which again pulls right from that customer default section. I have my code added here and you'll notice, watch that bill rate side. When I key in a pay rate of $13 an hour, that's automatically spitting out the bill rate. It's also giving me my overtime pay and bill, my double time pay and bill as well. Something else that you'll see in the financial details section is this unit pay rate and bill rate. So if your employees also get paid by units, maybe for every 100 pallets that get stacked, they receive an extra 
one dollar per stack we could put in that one dollar pay rate and then a bill rate as well so i know that's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis certainly not all of us will need it but it's just another way of being able to pay employees outside of hours so if they receive some other type of pay and it's not based on their hourly work you can utilize units for that in the contact section of the order what we're worried about classifying here are any major points of contact for this position, maybe their supervisor, who they should be reporting to, all of that can be listed here. So on this order, I'm going to go ahead and select the pencil icon to manage the contacts. Now what you'll see here is that all of the contacts listed in this dropdown are the same contacts that are tied to our customer record. In fact, if I jump back to that customer record here, I'll simply select the magnifying glass to do that. Let's save our changes. From the visit file of the customer record, sure enough, there we see those three contacts, Donna, Scott, and Darla. Honorable mention number two, customer contacts. Every order you make must have at least one customer contact, and that contact should be the person who either placed the order or is responsible for its operations. If you see that you have no customer contacts to choose from in the client file, it means that the branch manager failed to ensure that the customer file was created in full. This instance is known as having dirty data. If you encounter this situation, please be sure to bring it up to either your recruiter or branch manager so they may ensure that you have the proper tools to be able to complete your arrival and service calls. To navigate back to my order, it's as simple as selecting that order bar. When I do that, it takes me right to that details page of that order record, exactly where we left off. Tempworks is always smart enough. It remembers the last piece we were working on. So I'm going to go ahead and say Darla is the person that they are to report to. So we'll select the pencil icon to manage our contacts. From my dropdown, I'm going to select Darla. And I'm going to mark Darla as the person that they are to report to. Plus icon to do that, and then we'll go ahead and save. Notice that the order has my taken by name associated with it because I'm the person that entered the order. In the notes area of the job description, I can key in any other information that might be helpful for me to know as a recruiter, but is maybe information that I don't necessarily want or need to share with candidates. For instance, we could say we're screening for long-term fits and we should be asking behavioral-based questions during the screening process. And then I'll go ahead and save. Something else to mention about the orders is, in my opinion, if this was an order that I was working on maybe all day today or Tomorrow even, if it's an order that's going to require 10 or 20 people, it might be nice if I can really, really easily navigate back and jump to this order, even if I log out or log back into the system. So just a reminder, your icons are here to help you. If I select that star icon, here I can make this order my favorite. So by adding this order to my favorites, even if I log out or log back into the system over the next couple of days or however long I'm working on this order, I can very easily jump directly to it. Now the last kind of basic introductory piece that I want to cover with you guys today is just how you can locate and find all of your open orders in the system that need to be filled right now. And we complete that by doing a very basic order search. When I go to the order search area, we have our two main toggle buttons right in the center, just like what we saw when we were searching employee records the other day, right? So if I want to find all of my active and unfilled orders, the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to set this bottom toggle button to active. And that's how we're going to find all of those orders that have that green light in the system. Show me those that are active. They haven't been closed or lost or deleted. And then I don't just want to see those that are active and filled. I just want to see of those orders that have the green light on, only show me those that are unfilled. So I set these two toggle buttons to active, unfilled. We run that search. 
And this shows me that right now I have 84 different positions that are open that I could and should be working on. Now we can sort our results all sorts of ways. Right now I have them sorted by customer. I've got that carrot icon here showing me it's sorting them in an ascending order. Or I could sort them by job title. And we could even drag and drop this into that header to group them by job title. So if I get a cocktail bartender on the phone, I could run these different positions by them to see what they're interested in. To navigate to any of these orders, it's going to be as easy as double clicking. And that takes us right into that order. The creation of an order is a critical piece of communication amongst you and your fellow staff. The details of the order must be viewable by all staff members. Any information that exists only in the minds of our staff members could result in an operational oversight in the future. Operational oversights can cause injuries to our employees if we assign someone who is not fit for the position. It can even cause us to lose a client. This is why the following pieces of information are mandatory to include in each order. The appropriate client workers comp code the client worksite, the number of field employees required to fill the order, job title, a detailed job description listing all of the responsibilities of the order. Here, there must be enough information for someone who doesn't know anything about the client to begin to dispatch for the order. Think about the type of criminal background restrictions the client has requested. Is there a drug test required? How much weight will the employee be expected to lift? the expected end date, job start and end time, days of the week the job shall be conducted if applicable, the markup percentage and pay rate for the employee, any client contacts that are relevant to this order. This may differ if your client has multiple departments or rotating shifts. Aside from communicating with your team the details of an order, proper documentation is critical to other areas of the staffing cycle as well. From an employee perspective, creating accurate orders with all of the details of the job included in TempWorks will allow our field employees to log into their Web Center account and look at their start times, their pay rate, any details about their dress requirements, and the responsibilities of the job. It also provides yet another resource for, of information for your employees dispatched to a client location. We will cover Web Center in more detail in another section of your roadmap. But, from a recruiter standpoint, having a clear job description in the details area of an order makes it much easier to publish the order on our website for the public to see. Here, the details area can be copied and pasted into the web publishing area and modified for the public job board. In sum, accurate orders can help you all the way from recruiting an employee to the point of dispatch. In our last training, we wrapped up with discussing how to create and enter a new order in TempWorks Enterprise. I want to now focus our attention on some of that additional functionality within an order. The first item that I want to discuss with you is the concept of master orders. Now, master is a status that we can give an order within this detail section. You'll see if I expand my drop down here, master is one of those items that appears. What a master is really referring to is it's essentially making this a template of the position. So hypothetically, we would consider this a position that the tile shop calls into us every week or every couple of weeks. They're always looking for more forklift operators to do essentially the same job. A master order is meant to be copied. We should never be assigning employees to a master order. A master order also should not have start dates. Right now, my start date is 2-6-2017, but a few months from now, the next time they call this position in, a week from now, I'm not going to want to have that start date of 2-6-2017. We also may not want to have a duration. I might want to leave that as indefinite. So every time I copy the order, all of this information is going to pull through. The only difference that we'll see is my required will jump back to one. So let's go ahead and save this master order. 
Now, one of the reasons I like master orders is because they're searchable. This is a status that we can very easily search on here. For instance, if I go to my order search area, and let's just clear our criteria out from our last search, when we move into this enhance search section, and we go to the details page, in that section, we're going to see this order status drop down. I would set this order status to master. Show me all of my active master orders. We'll go ahead and run that search. And this shows me five potential master orders. So it looks like we have these five clients that could call us anytime and look for these positions. Now, again, my recommendation is get rid of the start date. We don't want to always copy that start date and have it listed at 118. So that's something I would certainly change. Now, if this is a search you could see yourself needing to run on a regular basis, because you get your master orders called in a lot, again, my recommendation is to save that search. So to save this search so we're not having to set it up every time, I simply select the save icon and I'm going to call it my high tech staffing master orders. Master orders for high tech staffing. And again, I could share that with my coworkers or keep it for myself. When I save, this is now available for me to run it within that saved searches section. And there's my high tech staffing master orders. And we select to run it. So with a master order, what do we do? How does it work? How do we copy a master order? Well, it's very easy. When I double click into my master order here, we can do it from any page within the order record. I can copy it from the details page or from the visa file because the copying functionality is actually taking place right here behind this actions menu. When I expand this hand icon or the actions menu, a lot of items appear for me. One of them is the ability to copy the order. That's what I'm going to select from this dropdown. So we'll click to copy the order. I'm then prompted with this window telling me that doing this will create a new copy of this order and navigate me to it. Would I like to continue? Absolutely, yes, I would. System blinks at me really quick here, so I don't know if you guys caught that. It happens very fast, but I now have a new order ID listed here, and if we go into the details page, it's going to look almost exactly the same. We have all of that same information. Uh, what did change is my order is now requiring one instead of the three that I had originally entered, but otherwise, this gives me an exact copy. So this is where I could say, okay, this unfilled order is going to actually be starting on Monday and we need two people to work it and they'll be working approximately five weeks on that AM shift. And then we go ahead and save. Another basic concept that I want to cover with all of you is the discussion of being able to locate orders. So we've talked about how we can always find our active and unfilled orders. We've also talked about how we can locate our master orders. Another big question that I tend to get is, well, how do I find all of my orders for a specific customer? And why don't we use the tile shop as our example? To begin, I'm going to clear my criteria out, give myself a new blank canvas to work with, and a really easy way to locate all orders for a specific customer is to just use this search bar across the top. So here's my customer search field. I'm just going to key in the tile, click enter to run that search. And wow, it's showing me we've had 35 total orders with the tile shop here. Now you'll see a lot of these are listed with a status of filled or deleted, closed, canceled, lost to competitor. Remember we can sort them by these categories. So this is showing me all of the different orders that we've ever had with the tile shop. If I just wanted to see our open positions, I could change this to active and unfilled and then run that search. And this time I'm down to two. We see our master order and the unfilled order scheduled to start on 2 6 2017. So for me, I tend to use the order search area quite a bit when it comes to locating orders for a customer or by a status or even for a particular branch. If I just wanted to see all of my orders in Memphis Southeast, 
that are active and unfilled. I utilize the search area. If I ever want to check on the profitability of an order, we can do that using our gross profit calculator. Again, that's hiding in the actions menu. Here I'll select gross profit calculator and we'll say if they work 40 hours a week over six weeks, what do we stand to gain? And there's our GP amount. At any point in time, if an order is lost, if we lose it to a competitor or to a customer, or if it gets canceled, the way that we close the order out is just by updating the status. So if we lose it to an internal fill, I'll document that it's been lost by updating the status and saving. You'll notice when I save, the green light is going to turn off. This deactivates the order, so it no longer counts as one of our active and unfilled positions. Okay, this is probably one of the most confusing points of discussion surrounding orders. Unclosed orders, or orders with the incorrect status, cause one of the biggest instances of dirty data. To clarify, let's take a moment to run through the major order statuses and when to use them. Unfilled and filled. An order with the status of unfilled simply means that you have not found the adequate number of employees to fill the order. When you assign the required number of employees to an unfilled order, the order will automatically change to filled. Unfilled and filled are the only statuses that you do not have to manually change. However, the rest of the statuses shown here must be changed according to your communications with your customers and employees. Canceled and canceled after filled. You must change the status of an order to canceled when your customer states that they no longer need our employees working at the specified job location. If they cancel the order after you have assigned the required number of employees, you must select the canceled after filled status. Closed. Finally, a closed order is one where the customer has stopped the need for additional employees because the job has ended and we were able to supply the customer with the required number of employees for the duration of the job. A few minutes ago, we discussed the critical pieces of information that are required for each individual order. Given that the majority of your clients place repeat orders that are very similar but not identical to those placed in the past, we highly suggest that the recruiter for each office take the time to build master orders that can be then modified for all of our major clients this will help save you time. Please note that the items discussed previously are going to be required of all IES staff members, regardless of whether or not your office implements the use of master orders. So your use of master orders will help make achieving 100% compliance with IES order standards much easier. And along those lines of compliance are things that can't be reflected in the order sheet of TempWorks, but only in your interactions with our clients. Now that we've covered the technical aspects of order creation and management, I'd like to take some time to discuss what will be expected of you from a relational perspective. Specifically, customer follow-up is critical not only to your success, but to the success of your branch and coworkers. One of the most common fears a staffer has is giving bad news to a client. Those of you that have worked in an office for a while might already be thinking of a time when you had to do this yourself. To be honest, we will all get this feeling at some point or another. So let's talk through some of the most common situations. Imagine it's Monday morning and you get a call from one of our customers. Joe from Treasure Valley Assembly needs five people to begin working in the shipping and receiving department one week from today. You say, okay, Joe, no problem. We'll start working on this now, just as you should. However, Tuesday comes around and you still haven't found anybody. Then Wednesday and still no luck. Same with Thursday until finally Friday comes in and you only have two people on the order and Joe wants to know if he's going to be able to run his line over the weekend. What should you do? Do you not call Joe until you have five people on the order? Do you not call Joe at all and just send the people you have and let him figure it out on his own? If you have any sense at all, your answer to that question is none of the above. In the worst case scenario, Customer follow-up is even more critical than usual. The fact is that Joe needs to be informed of your efforts every step of the way so he can begin to plan around our successes and failures. Specifically, on an order that is placed days in advance, it is expected that you call the customer at least once a day to touch base and fill them in on where you are with their talent acquisition needs. 
Our customer relationships will always be better off if we are the ones to tell them that we are coming up short and not the other way around. Take the opportunity for our clients to tell us we are doing a bad job away from them by beating them to the point. On the contrary, you must also call daily when things are going right. Nothing feels better for a client than receiving a call days in advance of their due date to find out that they have nothing to worry about over the weekend. We have established that communicating with our clients during our efforts to fill their order is a critical piece of what we do at IES. However, what happens after we fill the order is almost as critical as what we do beforehand. This brings us to the concept of arrival calls. An arrival call occurs when a staffing specialist takes an inventory of all of the new employees assigned to an order at the exact time the order is scheduled to start. For example, let's walk back to the story of Joe from Treasure Valley Assembly who ordered five people to start in the shipping and receiving department on Friday of this week at 8 o'clock in the morning. A week goes by and you dispatched seven people to the location five to fill the order, and two to pad it, just in case some of them fall through on their commitment. On Friday morning at precisely 8 o'clock, it is required that you call Joe and ask him who arrived at the worksite and how those individuals are doing. Never wait for Joe to call you and tell you we had employees fall through on their commitment. Additionally, you must call Joe every day at the start of a new employee shift for the first three days of the job and once a week for the remainder of the employee's assignment thereafter. This piece of customer follow-up is critical for what we do at IES. Not following this procedure will negatively impact the health of our company. Okay, so how does this actually negatively affect the health of our company? Is this just something that we say to get people to follow policy? To answer this, I'd like to spend a few minutes explaining how our competition in the staffing industry works. Basically, all of the companies that need staffing firms like ours are already using a primary staffing firm, meaning they give most if not all of their business to one staffing company. At IES, our goal is to acquire as many clients as possible so we have the greatest amount of financial security as possible so we can continue to function with a traditional office structure. However, Keeping in mind that all of the companies that need the help of a staffing firm are already committed to either us or one of our competitors, one of the only ways for our sales team to bring new sources of income to an office is to capitalize on the mistakes of our competitors. Mistakes being unanswered calls to action when another staffing firm's employee fails to report to their assigned location, missed arrival calls on the behalf of our competitors, and just an overall subpar customer service practice. Now that you know this is our strategy for stealing the business of our competitors, you must know that other staffing firms are just waiting until we miss a step in the staffing cycle and give our clients a reason to seek assistance outside of our company. Each time you miss an arrival call, each time you go without knowing the status of an order, and each time you fail to rectify a no-show is an instance in which you have given our competitors the opportunity to take our financial security away. Keep this in mind each time you start your workday. By conducting these calls, you are at the front line of information regarding your field employees. Commonly enough, you will be told by our clients that one or more of the employees we originally sent out to a job did not arrive for work. What do you think a client wants to hear from us after they disclose this information? The answer is, as I'm sure you know, is that we are going to take measures to solve their immediate staffing issue. When a client tells us that only three out of five employees we dispatched arrive at the work site, our immediate response must be to communicate that we will start calling our available employees and dispatch them to the work site immediately. Always assume that the client needs us to dispatch additional employees to make up for unforeseen circumstances. The only time we don't make efforts to rectify the situation is if a client explicitly asks us not to, and this rarely ever happens. In our efforts to rectify a situation where we had an employee fall through on their commitment with one of our customers, sometimes it's necessary to collaborate with them a little to meet the overall goal of getting work done. Remember that our clients are paying us not only to send them people, but to outsource their talent acquisition needs altogether because they don't have the resources, the ability, or time to do it themselves. 
Basically, this means that we are the most qualified, educated party when it comes to the subject of the labor market and recruiting. A customer will always want the perfect employee from us, and for that, I don't blame them. However, sometimes the limited experience in the labor market that our customers have gives them an unrealistic set of standards for the qualities that our next ditch digger must have. For example, let's say you get an order for a shipping and receiving clerk for Treasure Valley Assembly. The customer states that they will only accept people with at least a year of warehouse experience and no misdemeanor charges. Now, initially, you were able to provide them with the number and quality of employees that they needed. However, after completing your arrival call on day two of the order, you find out that one of your employees walked off the job and you currently have no candidates that fit the requirements your customer has communicated. What you do have, however, is a candidate with a good attitude, two solid years of fast food experience, and a drug paraphernalia misdemeanor that is three years old. And in your best judgment, you believe he would do just fine for Trevor Valley Assembly in this setting. In this scenario, you have the perfect opportunity to collaborate with your customer and sell them on the candidate that fits outside the lines. Take this chance to educate your client on the state of the situation and sell them on our expertise in getting the ultimate goal of getting work done. Furthermore, when you accomplish success in this way, you might prompt your customer to relax their strict requirements for future orders, making it easier and faster to meet their needs for future projects. In a previous section, you heard me use the term padding. In the staffing industry, we use this term to describe what can be known as preventative measures, or better yet, planning for the unexpected. As staffing professionals, we don't have a tangible product that can be kept in a box or stored on a shelf. Our product changes constantly and cannot be controlled. In fact, we deal with the most volatile item on the planet, and that's people. We can't predict where people will be, what they will do when they get there, and how long they will stay. When IES decides to open a branch in Russia, we can start keeping people in shipping containers until their labor assignment starts. But for now, we have to remain ethical. This is why we must always plan for uncertainty when dispatching by sending more than the required amount of employees to a job site, just in case your initial group does not appear as expected. This will greatly decrease the likelihood that you will have to have a negative arrival call the next day or whenever the job is scheduled to start. So how do you explain padding to a client or employee who is new to staffing? Someone who is new to staffing on both sides of the aisle might be surprised by having more than enough employees appear on the job site. Or an employee might be discouraged when they are sent away by our client. When in communications with your customer about their order, always inform them of our dispatching strategy by telling them the reason we are sending more than the required number of employees is because in our years of industry experience, there will almost always be at least one or more employees who fall through on their commitment, and that we are operating with their best interest in mind. I have yet to meet a customer who has responded negatively to this kind of communication. However, when communicating with employees, we must omit our padding strategy altogether. Informing employees to be dispatched of this technique will certainly lessen their self-worth and motivate them not to show up at the work site altogether, thus defeating the purpose of padding in the first place. Not to worry though, employees who are turned away will be eligible for two hours of pay if your customer turns them away. So use common sense when padding your orders. If the customer ordered two people, you're probably safe with one person as a pad for a total of three. If your customer orders five people, you should probably assign two pads for a total of seven and so on. The more people the client requires, the more preparation you need and expectation that somebody will fail. Also, keep in mind the quality of assignment. Employees are less likely to show at an assignment located at a slaughterhouse as opposed to a job selling daisies. For the jobs of the slaughterhouse variety, you must use more than the usual number of pads. One of the most important aspects of orders management is timeliness. By that, I mean in order to keep yourself organized as a staffing professional, you must document everything in real time. If you paid attention in the section of this training coordinated by our applicant tracking software, you know that orders are a representation of a need communicated to us by our customers. Basically, orders are a record of demand for our services. With that said, you must build a new order each time a new demand for our services arrives. 
For example, if Joe from Treasure Valley Assembly calls and states that he needs two temporary employees to start work one week from today, we must immediately document this phone call by building a new order with all of the points of information we listed at the beginning of this session. It is IES policy that you enter orders into TempWorks in real time. But what happens when Joe calls back in an hour and says he needs five people instead of two? The answer is that if the job Joe is referring to is the exact same job he called about earlier, all that is needed is that you go back into the order you created during Joe's first phone call and change the number of required field employees from two to five. On the other hand, if, de if the details of the job Joe is referring to in his second phone call differ from the job he described in the first phone call, you must create a new order requesting three employees in addition to the previous request. Consequently, it is also important to assign employees who commit to one of our jobs immediately after they communicate their commitment. For example, let's think about the order that Joe at Treasure Valley Assembly he needed two people for the following week, and you proceeded to make phone calls, text messages, emails, and interviews, and you found three qualified field employees to take the job on. Two of those employees are there to fill the order, and one of them is sent as an extra. We'll discuss padding and employee assignments in another video. In any case, it's likely that you found three employees on different days and times throughout the week. Therefore, each assignment card for these three employees will have a different timestamp under the assigned status. We will go over employee assignments in detail in a training specific to this subject in another video. For the purposes of this training, keep note of our company's policy on timely documentation. IES operational trainings illustrate the types of practices and habits that we believe provide the best possible outcomes for our company and therefore should be followed unless otherwise guided by an authorized member of management. Thanks for watching.